In this tutorial, we're going to have a look at how to render diffuse lighting in a scene. Before we go on though, make sure that you've watched and understood the lighting tutorial because I won't be reviewing those concepts again. I should also say that this tutorial is just a continuation of the previous coding tutorial on matrix multiplication, so you might want to go back and review that as well. Now the first thing that you'll notice is that I've included this header file flim underscore small dot h. So let's go ahead and have a look at that file real quick. To generate this file, I wrote a program I called obj to h, and it basically converts obj files to header files. Now at the top of this file, you'll see that there's three variables that we're going to refer to later, and these variables are called num indices, num vertices, and num normals. Shortly after that, you can see that we have an array of GL floats called vertices, and of course this holds the position information of the vertices. Now I'm not going to scroll to the bottom of this file because it's quite large, but we also have two other arrays. One is another array of GL floats called normals, and the other is an array of GL unsigned ints called indices. And then if you look over here on the left hand side, you can see that we've got a couple more. We've got Buddha.h and we also have Dragon.h. And these files also have the same kind of structure to them. All right, let's jump back over here to main. And if you look here on lines 11 and 12, you can see that we use those variables num vertices and num indices. And in this case, we're going to use the preprocessor to minimize the amount of changes that we have to do to this code. All right, the next important change is on line 20. And if you look here, you can see that we've defined a directional light that's really just an array of GL floats. So in this case, you can think of it as casting light into the scene from just up above and behind the camera. So because we are doing diffuse lighting, we're going to have to pass the normal of each vertex to the shader. So if you look on line 25, you can see that I have this variable normal ID that's going to behave very similar to position ID. And this is how we're going to link to the normal variable inside the shader. All right, if you drop down to lines 29 and 30, you can see that we have two other variables for IDs. Now on line 30, it should be apparent that this variable is going to be used to hold the ID of the light in the shader. But if you drop down to line 36, you can see that we've got this variable called all rots matrix. And this is going to be used to hold all of the rotation information for the model. So in other words, it's really going to be a combination of the rot x matrix, the rot y matrix, and the rot z matrix. Now you may be asking yourself why we have to do that. Well, when it comes time to rotate the normals, we don't want to include the translation information at the same time. We only want those normals to be affected by the rotations. All right, good. So if we drop down a little bit more, you can see that I've initialized that all rots matrix, and I've initially set it to be the identity matrix. Now if we continue on down to the render function, you can see that almost all of this code is the same as last time. The differences here are on line 164, where you can see that we've copied the rotation Y matrix into the all rots matrix. Now the reason that we did this this way is because we didn't have any information in the rot X or the rot Z matrix. So we just copied rot Y directly into the all rots matrix. Now notice also in line 173 that we've moved that rotation information over to the shader. And then just after that, we did the same thing with the light. All right, good. So to finish out main.cpp, let's drop down to the main function here real quick. And if you look here on line 213, you can see that there's a small but really important change. Now, if you remember, when we call GL buffer data, you have to pass it the size of the buffer that you want. Now, in our previous example, we called GL buffer data similar to what you see in line 212, which is now commented out. If you remember in the previous examples, we had seven pieces of information. We had an XYZ position for each vertex, but we also had an RGBA color. This time we only have six elements per vertex because we still have an X, Y, and Z, but we also have three elements for each normal. And if you look down in line 219, you can see that we've made the change there as well. All right, good. So if you look in lines 231 and 237, you can see that we get the IDs of the variables V light and M rotations in the shader. And then in lines 240 and 242, we tell OpenGL where it can find the position and normal information inside that buffer. Now, there's some new code in lines 249 through 251, but before I explain what's going on, I want to show you what we currently have. So let me go ahead and run it for just a minute. And I'll go ahead and shut that down. Now what I'm going to do now is to comment out line 251, and then I'm going to run it again. 
and you can see that we get some strange behavior. It almost looks like the dragon is inside out. So you may be asking yourself what's going on. So let me uncomment line 251 and talk about GL depth test. Now if we scroll up to the top of main, you can see that we called glut init display mode and we passed it something very specific. In this line, we told glut we wanted enough video memory for RGBA color, for double buffering, which removes flickering during animations, and a depth buffer. And notice how we did that. We used the bitwise OR operator between all three of those constants. Now let's drop back and look at this code. And you can see that we've called GL enable passing it GL depth test. Now what's going on here is that as you draw a pixel on the screen, the depth buffer is going to remember how deep that pixel was in the scene. And that way, if there's any other pixels that could be drawn in that location, it's going to pick the one that's closest to the camera. In other words, the closest pixel wins. All right, good. So let's go ahead and have a look at the vertex shader. And you can see that we have a couple of changes here as well. To begin with, in line 4, you can see that we have a new variable to hold the normal of the vertex. On line 12, we have a new matrix called M rotations, And again, this is used to hold all the rotations of the model. On line 15, you can see that we have a variable for our light. And then on lines 18 and 19, we have two variables that are going to go out to the fragment shader. Now the first one, Fn, is going to be the interpolated normal of the pixel, and then Fl is going to be the light direction. Now one thing that's really important to note is that we're no longer manually coloring our vertices. Instead, we're going to be using those lighting equations that we saw previously. So if you look down on line 23, the first thing that we have to do is to rotate the normal. Remember, our model is rotating, and because of that, the normals are rotating too. Now on line 24, we're simplifying the process and only taking the first three elements of the light. In other words, it's not necessary to work with that fourth component yet. All right, and then to finish it off, you can see that in line 27, we calculate GL position the same way we did last time. All right, let's jump over to the fragment shader now. And this is really where the magic happens. Now, if you look on lines 3 and 4, you can see that we have two in variables that came from the vertex shader. And we also have an out variable, just like we had last time, that represents the final color of this pixel. All right, now, if you look on lines 9 and 10, you can see that the first thing that we want to do is to normalize those vectors. Then, to figure out the intensity of the light that's hitting that pixel, look at line 11. Now, if you look at this line, you can see that we take the dot product between n and l. Because that value can be negative, we have to take the max of that value with zero. In other words, we can never have a negative intensity. Now watch how we use that intensity. Because its value has to be between zero and one, I'm going to assign the diffuse intensity to all three color components. And what this does is give us a grayscale color model. If the diffuse intensity turns out to be zero, we get the color black. And if the diffuse intensity turns out to be one, we get the color white. Now notice the last value here on line 12 is a 0.5, but in this case it really has no effect. All right, now to finish this discussion out, I'm going to comment out line 12, and I'm going to uncomment this chunk of code between 14 and 19. Now in this case, if the diffuse intensity turns out to be zero, I don't really want to color it to be black, I want to color it to be red. Otherwise, if it's a positive value, we'll color it the same way we did last time. Now I'll go ahead and run it so you can see the effects of that code. And I'll go ahead and shut that down. Now, if instead I change those values from red to something a little bit more reasonable, like 0 0.05, and save it and run it, you can see that some of those dark areas are not quite so dark. All right, so that's it. Hopefully, you understand a little bit more of the practical side of diffuse lighting in OpenGL.